Hello everyone and welcome back to our voice from number six. My name is Grace. If you want if you want to submit a case for me, please go to our voice from the missing dot net and click on the case submissions link. And this week's episode is on the death of Megan McDonald. Megan McDonald was really was ready when she was killed. An Orange County resident her body was found in a field in Wallkill in Wallkill on March 15, 2003. It was March 15, 2003 when the body of a young woman was discovered in a field in the town of Wallkill in the Orange County city of the middle town. Her white Mercury Sable car was found two days later in a parking lot in the Kensington, Kensington Manor Complex, also in Wallkill. McDonald, again, who lived in Orange County, has been, uh, I'm sorry if I pronounce this wrong, Stoney? Orange County Community College student. She worked at the Galleria Mall in Middletown and she died of blood, blood force trauma. No arrests have been made. Wednesday, Wednesday marks 20 years since McDonald's remains were found in the field of Bowser Road. Her father was a retired uh, NYPD detective who died in 2002, a year before McDonald's was killed. The, uh, the NYC Detectives Endowment Association is offering a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of a killer. McDonald's story was the subject of a Dateline episode last year in which the detectives discussed the latest development in the case. McDonald talked with two people she knew who were serving a birthday party in Wallkill near Greenway Terrace. They supposedly tried to get her to join and she refused. Detectives told, detectives told they learned that people who attended the party later reported those two people had come back and said the rest of the group uh, and said the rest of the group went on left to spend time with the friends in our town and told the rest of the group went on left to spend time with other friends in our town. I'm sorry. According to the Dayton report, she ended up at her friend's home and stayed until that night. She told her friend she had to go home because she had to get up early for work in the morning. Detective Stone told Dayton. The friend didn't see her again and Detective Stone Dayton McDonald went back to that party and sent her home. She left quickly telling two other friends she would hang out with somebody. Detective Stone Daylight. In the main interview, an initial witness had a new detail. New York State Police Detective Brad, I'm sorry, I didn't know if I pronounced his name wrong. Natalia. Natalia is here? I'm sorry. Told the Dateline that her data radio with a loud sound system had been seen behind McDonald's car. According to the Dateline report, the witness, the witness also only noticed it because the volume was so loud. It was likely a dark car that looked like a Honda Civic hatchback. McDonald's family had just started to worry when they hadn't heard from her and she didn't show up for work on, on March 14, 2003. The next day, the same detective 
that I can't pronounce. I will spell it though. It's N as in Nancy, A, T as in Tom, A, L, I, Z as in, Z as in Zebra, I, O. Again, the detective's name is N as in Nancy, A, T as in Tom, A, L, I, Z as in Zebra, I, O. So the deadline that the people who own property on Bowser Road, on Bowser Road called the police to report the body. Investigators said that the find McDonald by her driver's license and say they believe she was killed in the field. She had been murdered in her own driver's seat. Um, detective. I'm so sorry. And Natalia told me like, my heart goes out to the entire McDonald's family, and I can't even comprehend the pain that the surviving family members must feel after losing two family members within a year apart. This family deserves closure. Whoever killed this beautiful young girl, please come forward and show that you have at least one ounce of compassion for the family that you needlessly, needlessly toward your parts. I don't know why you did what you did, but I sincerely hope you find Jesus Christ before your actions catch up with you. Don't hesitate to contact and for the people who are, who are watching this. Don't hesitate to contact your local FBI office or the nearest American Embassy or Consulate if you have any information concerning Megan. If the McDonald, if the McDonald family ever sees this video, please know that all of you will be in my thoughts and prayers. Until next week, God bless and be kind to one another. Thank you for watching. And just as a reminder, I do have a Patreon called A Voice for the Missing. So just go to patreon.com slash A Voice for the Missing and you will get the episodes two days early before they release on YouTube and podcast and also you will get a monthly discussion Zoom link for the case that I covered up for that week. So please join my Patreon it will help a lot in financing the podcast and my YouTube channel and also just my life in general. So please go to my Patreon. Also go to the website buy me a buy me a coffee dot com slash voice and you will get the same exact benefits as you do on Patreon. And also um I have a website called a voice for the missing dot net where you can submit your case to me and I will contact you and also you I also post the episode on there so you are more than willing you are more than happy to watch the videos on my website also I think that covers everything so thank you all for watching have a blessed day Let's have a blessed day and you know, and week and I truly appreciate you watching this video. Um I am gonna post two video clips, two news clips of the news covering Megan McDonald's murder and also a court conference that they're doing since they reopened the case.
so I will post those two videos along with this video. So I hope you enjoy. I hope you recognize her or can help with this case to rest so that the McDonald family can heal and can have closure to know what happened to their daughter and to know that her murderer is behind all this. Thank you for watching. God bless and I'll talk to you next week. Have a blessed day. Bye. Megan McDonald's father investigated some of the biggest cases in New York City, including the first bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993. But he died a year before his youngest daughter suffered a brutal death. Everybody loves Megan. <laughs> this was Megan McDonald on Christmas Day 2002. Uh. I can see it. <laughs> Trying to feel some joy just months after her father, homicide detective Dennis McDonald, died suddenly of a heart attack. Then the unthinkable. We're still actively investigating a homicide from 2003. On March 15, 2003, Megan McDonald, age 20, was discovered murdered on a dirt path in Wallkill, Orange County. The student at SUNY Orange bludgeoned repeatedly in the head. This case is unique in nature in that uh, the level of violence that was inflicted on Megan um, is something that I've never seen in any other case. Paul DiGiacomo, president of the Detectives Endowment Association, only recently found out the Orange County cold case involved the daughter of an NYPD homicide investigator. Well, there's no greater loss than the loss of a child, and in particular, one of our detectives. So DiGiacomo recruited active and retired detectives to hand out flyers on the 19th anniversary of Megan McDonald's murder. So we're to take to 11. The DEA offering a $10,000 reward for information leading to the killer's arrest Rest, the FBI doing the same. There's about probably over a thousand leads at this point. State um, police say Megan McDonald knew her killer and revealed that a witness recently gave them a crucial piece of information. It's in regards to a uh, Honda Civic hatchback style vehicle uh, with a loud sound system, which was observed following Megan's vehicle the night of the homicide in Kensington Manor. Police cleared the original suspect in the case, one of Megan's ex-boyfriends. They learned the real person of interest in another man, got into Megan's car to hang out near Bowser Road in Wallkill, the site where her body was found. <laughs> Megan's sister doesn't live in Orange County anymore, but she provided the photos that gave us a glimpse of Megan's life there, calling her younger sibling a spitfire who didn't take any guff. Karen Whalen told PIX11 News, we want this killer to know that he's a coward. He attacked my sister from behind. He was a coward, and he can't keep hiding. Lamar Advertising offered to feature Megan McDonald's cold case free of charge on seven of its electronic billboards that line Route 17 in both Orange and Sullivan counties. We want you to think about that vehicle of interest. And to think of Megan McDonald, who was working at the Galleria Mall to pay for rent at her new apartment, her killer intimidating witnesses all these years, according to police. We're here to, to tell those individuals that uh, they are not going to be in any trouble. The state police making it clear they only want to prosecute one person in this case, the killer. They told us they have significant DNA from Megan McDonald's car, but need a witness to corroborate their key evidence. A lot of the officers that, um, that are helping us with this case are Megan's age. And uh, many of them went to high school with her. Many of them know the family. Many of them know them personal. Um, a lot of the officers and troopers and anyone working on this case uh, takes this case very, very personal. March 13, 2003, she was excited and eager to start that new chapter of her life. She went to uh, work at the American Cafe. Uh, she worked from about 10.30 a.m. till about 3.30 p.m. She then went to that friend's house and hung out there from about 7.30 p.m. to midnight, uh, where they watched uh, the show Friends. Um, she then advised that friend that uh, she was going to be going home because she had to work the next day. Uh, she did go back to the area of Greenway Terrace, where uh, she was observed by one of her friends. And uh, at that point, uh, we do have good information of where she went. Uh, she was scheduled to work, uh, start her shift at noon, uh, March 14, 2003 but she never, never showed up. Within the past couple of years, we were able to 
uh, by speaking with witnesses and individuals that have never been interviewed before, narrow down that timeline uh, significantly. Within the next couple days, her body was observed um, by individuals on the area of Bowser Road. The state police identified her through her New York State driver's license. They observed that there were tire tracks uh, on that in that open field as well, off, off of Bowser Road, um, and, but there was no vehicle. They entered, uh, they, they did a uh, registration check to see what vehicles belonged to her, and they found out that the sole vehicle that belonged to Megan McDonald was a uh, 1991 Mercury Sable, color white, and an individual who lives in Kensington Manor uh, read that article and uh, observed that vehicle uh, in the Kensington Manor parking lot. So the FBI, they've been assisting us with this, this case for the past couple of years with several new investigative techniques. Uh, it's not only the, the FBI, but uh, surrounding agencies as well. This is a lot different than many other cases. Just because there's so much evidence, technology has advanced and that's created uh, more evidence. Investigator Corletta and I uh, went back to the vault and we examined um, each item of evidence. There's over 700 items of evidence in this case and uh, we went through each item. When it comes to DNA, uh, many people think that uh, DNA is the smoking gun. Um, but in this case, this particular case, uh, we have to keep an open mind that Megan may have very well knew her killer. And um, that individual's DNA, if it's in her car or um, as part of the crime scene, um, doesn't necessarily, uh, isn't the smoking gun. Couldn't, doesn't mean it's necessarily the smoking gun. It's about tying in her timeline, uh, tying in the facts of the case, uh, combining it with, with the, uh, the DNA evidence.